may work because everybody believes in their heart that they are taking dominion and they are advancing the kingdom and then when you get into a conversation with them you hear all of the reasons why they're not taking dominion and why they're not advancing the kingdom and why they're so busy um, I would venture to say that if you could take the word busy out of your vocabulary you may find out that you really were never really busy <laughs> because anytime you have a word in your vocabulary that lends itself to being an excuse in your life you're gonna use it and busy is one of those words that a lot of people like to use because they want to give a reason why they're not doing something for God or they're not accomplishing something in their own life you know Hallelujah. This one kid plays volleyball for me. I asked him, hey, your parents come into the game? He said, no, they're too busy. I said, busy? How come they're busy? He goes, I don't know. They work all day. I said, yeah, but our games are nighttime. He said, oh, I don't know then. So that kind of set the tone for me that there's a lot of people using the word busy, but they're not, they're not really busy. It's just an excuse. Now, you know, this ministry, we average anywhere from two to four hundred email a day messages requests um, whatever it is and you know I I take the time and I go through all of them and uh, I try not to use the word busy because I'm just that way I, I'm a person of accomplishment I like to get things done so we get all of these requests we get all of these um, inquiries about the, the number one thing that consumes the time is when people write in and they ask questions about the word because then you gotta, you gotta take the time to understand where they're coming from, and you gotta process that, and then you gotta talk to the Lord, and then you gotta answer. And how many know that the answer has to be accurate? You cannot just answer everybody with a, uh, because the Bible says so. Uh, you gotta actually, it kind of tests me a little bit to make sure that I, I understand what the the word is saying. Not only for me, but for others, because we're banking on this um, ministry for other people. We're not here for ourselves. If you're here for yourself, you're, you're in it for all the wrong reasons. And you will be found out. God will find you out quick. Because when you have an opportunity to say something, there's nothing new under the sun. All right. So understand that from this Genesis chapter 1 that you're in this morning, all the way to Revelation, uh, you can find something for everybody including yourself so uh, dominion is a funny word again because you cannot take dominion and say you're busy at the same time everybody say amen amen dominion is a funny thing because it's a word of action and it's also a state of being it's not a state of mind you cannot dominate something in your mind uh, your mind is constantly under barrage uh, through different thoughts and different things that are going on so you got to be a person that is firm in your convictions, and you got to understand how the word works for you. Uh, if you sit in this church for any length of time, you will find out that the word is everything to you because the word is what became flesh, and his name was Jesus. If you say you believe in Jesus, then you got to believe in the word. And if you believe in that word, you better study that word. Amen? Now, I'm not talking about studying in a, in a sense of taking it uh, as a study student in school kind of thing. Uh, your school was life, and your school continues to be life. Uh, many of you have accomplished even a master's degree in the Bible if you understand your childhood. Yeah? Because most of you in this room went through more stuff than most people will ever go through in their whole life. And you got to wonder, okay, how come some churches are so huge? How come they have so many people? Well, you go back and you understand what they're teaching there. Because people will migrate to something that they haven't yet accomplished. Does that make sense to you? So for us, you know, the numbers start, the deeper you go into the Holy of Holies, the numbers start shrinking. I know a guy with a church of only four people. And I'll be honest with you, this guy's knowledge base in the word on grace and kingdom is so deep and so advanced. I started asking, well, how come more people don't want that message? Is it because they don't want the responsibility that comes with that message? So for you, hey, you're part of something that's far greater 
Uh, don't look at the numbers in a church. That does not measure the success of a church. In fact, I would say that the bigger it is, the bigger the nursery is. You know, how many people are you know, going to college right now? You just look. Well, there's thousands of kids going to college. And then how many of them are, as they get closer to the degree, less people go? And then once they accomplish that, then they go into their master's, then that group gets smaller. Then if you're going to get your doctorate, that's an even smaller group. So you got to understand the deeper you go, the more personal it becomes for you. If you're looking to draw a crowd, it's not going to happen. You know why? If you're in a, in a system of a kingdom, there's only one king. And everybody else kind of falls into line under that. So just know that it may be a lonely walk for you. <laughs> Hallelujah. But <laughs> I'll just, uh, if you want to be real clear about it, the more comfortable you get with God in a relationship with God, you really don't want to drag too many people in there with you anyway. <laughs> Come on now. That's why I'm very leery of huge, huge churches because that's more like a babysitter. That's like a nursery. And then it, yeah. So, hallelujah. You can take a look at it any way you want. Look at it for yourself, though. How many of you are pursuing this doctorate in kingdom studies? Well, we all are. We're all studying to be kings and priests. Amen. All right. So it starts off like this in Genesis chapter 1, right? If you go there, all right, and we're going to throw it up there. But uh, on your notes, on the back side of the teddy bear, on the back side, yeah. I've seen a lot of pastors and different things try and build a kingdom within their kingdom. Uh, churches that try and build a kingdom and try to say, well, we have this much, this many. How many know that God does, doesn't ever pinpoint numbers? In fact, if you want to really get down to the brass tacks, King David was instructed by the Lord not to count anything. You guys remember that? He was instructed specifically by the Lord, do not take a census, do not count, I don't, because God doesn't operate by numbers, that limits God. Your God, your Father, your King is the God of infinity. Uh, it's man that puts limits on God, and that, that kind of becomes the problem. Uh, when you start saying, well, we have this many ministries, we have this many churches, we have this many people, we have this much in the offering, we have this, man, you know that the Lord is not pleased with that kind of thing. I'll tell you that right now. When, whenever you are saying a number that you have used as accomplishment, I'm going to be perfectly honest with you. God is not pleased with you. Let me tell you why. Because God is only concerned about you and Him. He is not concerned with any benefit you get out of a relationship with Him. When He called you blessed, He didn't tell you to count how many blessings you had. He didn't tell you to count how many people are in your Bible study group. He did not call you to tell Him how many people are in your church or how many people are in your kingdom. Because it is, it's a personal kingdom when it gets down to that. God is only concerned with how is your relationship with me. It's me and you and no more. That's it. Anything else you get out of that is strictly a benefit of your one-on-one -on -one relationship with God. If you don't have a one-on-one -on -one relationship with God, stop crying about it. Amen. You better start investing more time that you have in your mind with God. Because the only thing limiting you is your busyness. That's true. Amen. Uh, hallelujah. Excuses are a funny thing because everybody has one ready to go at any moment. Everybody. You know what the number one excuse you have is? Busy. The second big ex excuse you have is no more money. No more time. I have to. You are putting things above God. Amen. So you need to stop. So God has given you this authority. Now take a look at the back of your notes. I put the word in big letters for you today. What did God give you? Well, he gave you the authority to have dominion. dominion. Uh, dominion, another word that's locked into the word dominion, is domination. All right? If you tell me you're busy, I know what's dominating you. You're not dominating anything out here when you say you're busy. Because remember, the Bible calls you to be instant, in season, and out of season. You know what instant is? It means that you are ready now. You cannot say, well, I got to, let me take care of, oh wait, I got 
God will just move on and choose somebody else who's in a one-on-one with him. Don't, don't be a person that beats yourself up if God uses somebody else. Don't. I'll tell you the number one reason God uses other people is because the ones he chooses say they're busy. As soon as you say you're busy, you're eliminated. You're not disqualified, you're just eliminated. You're passed over. God will use somebody else who's available. You see, the word available is a funny word because at the back end of available. And what comes along with able? Ready and willing. Yeah. Hallelujah. I understand everybody has a job. Everybody got to go work. I understand that. But within that work, you can still reach people. You can still hone the word in your own life. Because the Bible says in the Old Testament, iron sharpens iron. So how many you know that your iron better be sharp all the time? You know that on any given morning like this, I try not to look at my phone at all before I come to church. But there's some mornings that I say, ah, just take a look. And I look and I get all the excuses of all the people who are not here today. Why they're not here. And I just look at that and I say, then you're missing out. You're missing out. You, you're going to miss out. And, you know. Some people just say, oh, I can go online now and listen. It's not the same. It's not the same. The word is the same. The preaching is the same. But your active participation is delayed. So at the moment of conception, because some of you know that this, uh, boys and girls, church is a womb where things are birthed forth. If you're not here, then you're just watching on TV a birth. Amen. So you got to be in the birth canal, which is what this kind of represents. Any church in the world represents a birth canal. Uh, Whatever you get comes out of you when you leave the house. So if your life is screwed up and messed up and you're having problems, it's because whatever you're downloading or whatever. You know, sometimes, I'll just say this. People are in churches way too long. You know, there's certain kinds of churches you get to a level and then you kind of plateau and you see everybody in there just kind of grouchy going through the motions. Because there's no real new revelation coming out. I, I was part of a Pentecostal system. All they talked about was faith. That's it. Faith. Faith, 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 faith. Everything was faith because they would uh, constantly sit on the scripture that says we walk by faith, not by sight. Well, you got to look at that uh, verse in context. Because if you're going to constantly walk by faith, you will never see something manifest later. You got to have a constant state of movement where you walk by faith, not by sight, because it appears. You don't have to look for it. That's what the word really means. We walk by faith, not by sight, because you don't look for it before you get it. You get it as you walk in faith. So if you're not in a constant state of getting, then you go right back to the excuse of the word faith. Because there's a lot of people, and I understand this, they constantly are sowing seed for something that they believe should happen, but it never happens because they hide behind the word faith as an excuse. And then they always blame God and say, well, God must not have wanted me to have that yet. How many of you have heard that before? Let me go one step further. How many of you use that scripture before? Oh, it's coming. It's coming. How how long is it going to come? As soon as you eliminate all the excuses, the word busy, the I gotta, or they, and them, and my kids, and my friend, and my husband, or my wife. You gotta knock it off. You'll never see. That's where your faith is at. So, I went on a huge migration through all of these different kinds of uh, messages. So don't tell me that I don't know faith because I lived that thing right out of the birth canal that I got birthed out of. I walked right into faith. I spent time in faith. I became an expert at the word faith. So that you can't tell me that I don't know what I'm talking about because I'm only kingdom in grace. No, 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 no. My first church was all faith all the time. The second church I attended was all love and no faith. So I understand both sides of the coin. So you cannot BS me. I have found a place where I like it and I love it and I understand it. It took me a while to get there, but here I am. So there's a lot of people say, well, you don't understand. But my pastor at my last church said, we walk by faith and not by sight. Uh, God gave you sight 
eventually it got to kick in with your faith. What are you telling me? That God made everybody spiritually blind and physically blind? So that we never look? Man, you got to have accomplishment in your life all the time. Amen? So look at your notes again. God has given you authority to have what? Dominion over what? Hallelujah. Now, some of you, I, I can hear the wheels clicking. I can smell smoke coming out of your head. Your machine is working. Because when you look at this now, because of what you've learned here over all the earth, the number one thing you dominate is your earth. And what are you made out of? <laughs> you want to talk about faith? Take a look at yourself. You just had communion. Did you guys all see the heading right before the communion? It said, examine yourself. You know, the, the Christians are funny lot. They like to look at other people first before they look at themselves. Don't measure yourself against somebody else. You know, I, the more you measure yourself against somebody else, you are seeking after sawdust. You're looking for sawdust when you are the log. You're looking to take your log and beat sawdust into the ground with, until it becomes earth. Hallelujah. You know, the more people that I see judge, I understand, they have no clue what they're talking about. They don't even know what the word says about anything. They're just acting. All they're doing is becoming a repeat system for whatever their former pastor said. I don't want to hear what your former pastor said. I want to hear what God is saying through you now. Don't tell me what you did before. That was before. Yesterday is dead and gone. Here you are today. Even Jesus said, don't even look to tomorrow. Look at today. What are you doing now? What are you doing right now? I'll tell you right now. Some of you have less than a year to live. You want to be real? Some of you have less than one year to live. What's your exit strategy? Some of you have 20 years left to live. Less than 20. Some of you have less than 50 years to live. What are you going to do? See, all of us, we don't understand. If you want to take a look at things, we're all on course to die one day. But what are you doing today? What seeds have you sown today? Because your seeds ensure you tomorrow already. You don't have to worry about tomorrow. Give no thought, Jesus said, for tomorrow. Because it's taken care of by what you sow today. Everything you plug in is plugged in for good. Your power source doesn't go away. But if you don't plug in, that's up to you. So the number one dominating thing that you got to do, or if you want to take dominion for real, take a look at yourself. What are you dominating in yourself? In yourself. Hallelujah. You know your biggest enemy is between your ears? I look at people. One time I was praying and the Lord showed me a person and they were doing this. <laughs> and I was like, what the heck was that? And the Lord was just showing me. Then I look past the skull bone and there's a machine running. And the mouth was the exhaust. <laughs> and all I kept doing was talking and talking and talking and talking and talking. Because right here and then out the mouth. Right here, out the mouth. It's like a machine. <laughs> and then I pulled back and I said, Lord, what is that all about? He said... They're programmed to say the same things over and over. There's no creativity in their minds. You know that sometimes you get so full of Pentecostalism that you forget that there's a victory after Pentecost. You get so caught up in the upper room. Oh, we're in the upper room. Oh, You know, my first church when I first started this deal was downtown Hilo where Regal Travel is now. That was my church. And New Hope took over after me. They came in. Uh, when we were up there, um, we had a, you know, a small congregation, maybe 10 or so. And we moved into this upstairs. And then we had this lady come and visit. She oh, my, you're all in the upper room. Oh, this is such a special place. It's the upper room. Oh. I was like, see, I'm more of a realist. Like, who cares? If you guys want an upper room experience, go help in the children's ministry. Just Those kids will test your faith. If you know our kids, they're the wisest kids in the world. Mm. 
Look at this cast of characters that produced that up there. And I can tell you right now, when you go up there, you will hear everything that their parents say. Be exactly to the T. And then they will tell the teacher if they get upset or they get scolded. They'll say, but my mommy said, but my dad said. So do I understand the Pentecost message? Absolutely. Because people come in here all the time with their, well, my pastor said. Why well, ain't your pastor? That's why you're here. What? Don't be a stepkid in the house. Be a son or a daughter. Be a real child of a house. How many of you belong to this house? Then this is your house. Be like this. Kingdom, grace, love, faith. They all find their place in there. Amen. Be a person of smarts. Dominate the earth between your ears. Fix this. And everything in your life is fixed. If we take an offering, you shouldn't say, Lord, how much? You already know in your heart what's going to come out. And it ain't coins. All right. Hallelujah. <laughs> Here you go. Genesis 1, verse 26. All right. You can start in 24. All right. Let's go up a little bit because it'll kind of set the tone for you on the creeping things. There's a lot of creeps out there. And God said, let the earth bring forth the living creature according to its kind. Okay, you can stop right there. You all know that humans make humans. <laughs> Hallelujah. You see the things I got to take time to teach in here? <laughs> okay, let's go one step further. If I'm in a church that does not believe in tongues or casting out demons or raising the dead or even praying, what am I reproducing? It's going to be a living thing, but is it going to be an alive thing? Okay, as long as you understand. Let the earth bring forth the living creature according to its kind. Cattle and creeping thing and beasts of the earth, each according to its kind. And it was so. And God made the beasts of the earth according to its kind. Cattle, blah, blah, blah. And then God saw that it was good. All right. So everything out here is good. You know, even in infantile teaching churches, it's good for the person for a while. Eventually, you're going to get more and more things going on in your life. And you're going to have to deal with that. So all of us in here... Eh, we all we all dealing with something. I would say that more so, rather than dealing with something, you're dealing with somebody. Because every one of your problems has somebody attached to it, and if it doesn't have an external person attached to it, then you're the problem. You just got to be real with yourself. This is. Let me tell you something. I didn't start this church to be fake and phony for people. Anything you're going through probably has somebody attached to it. More, more often than not, if you get rid of that person, it's going to bring another person just like them. And when you get rid of that person, and you say, ah, another one just like them shows up. Because the enemy understands who you are and what you attract. So again, like she's saying, the common denominator in all these attractions... Is you. So if you fix you, you fix all the attractions. You guys catch my drift? Again, God has given you authority to have dominion over all the earth. Not just the earth you stand on, the one that you're made out of, you. You got to dominate yourself. All right, I hope you're getting something out of this. Then God said in verse 26, let us notice the plural, us. So God is not having a conversation. He's not schizophrenic talking to himself. There's people there, all right? Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have, oh, you like that word? Dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds, over the cattle, over all the earth. And over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Hmm. Now, if there's a cockroach running around here, you have the authority and dominion too. So some of you are like, ah! 
and you miss. And then what? Then you start doing river dance, right? And you try and, or kachi kachi, or you boogie down, or, or you just could potentially just run away. So, the power of dominion is right there for you. Some people believe, I can't kill it, it's a living thing. Let me tell you something else that is a living thing that you may need to stab. <clears throat> your thought processes. You may have to kill this mindset that you have in your head. That's why it's called a mindset. It's set. It's set on something that you need to break yourself off of. A mindset is a problem because when something happens, you go readily to your mindset to deal with the problem. When the problem may not be the problem, the problem may be your mindset. Everybody cool with that? <laughs> I was talking to this doctor one time. He sat in on a message that I had taught. I believe it was in Miami, Florida. I was in Miami and I was teaching. And this doctor comes up to me afterward and, and he's telling me, man, that's some very incredible things you're teaching. I said, no, so what do you do? He told me, oh, I'm a doctor, I'm a family physician, so I deal with uh, about 40 patients a day on average, he said. I said, oh. And I said, so what do you think about that? He says, well, you know, the majority of the problems that walk through my office every single day were conjured up in the realms of their mind first. He said, that's why they're here. And I, I was talking to him next to a, a he was driving a Maserati. He doesn't know what a Maserati is. And I said, that's a nice car for a family physician. He says, it's all built based on mindsets. He said, he said uh, one day I came to the conclusion in my life that, you know, I was driving. He said he was driving like a Ford Explorer out of medical school. And he said, he started to see, wow, hey, you know, I'm starting to make a few bucks. Let me reward myself for all my studies. And I went out and I, he said, I looked at a lot of cars and I saw a Maserati and I bought it. I said, good for you. Good for you. He said, yeah. I said, so payments? He said, no, all cash. Mm. Probably $150,000 car. When I looked it up, you know, he says, all based on people's problems in their mind. I said, so do you ever turn away patients? He said, no. Because people are never satisfied. They will pursue you until they are convinced that you have the solution to all their problems. So, you know what he did? He made up a line of vitamins. Vitamins now. And he had his own label put on it. And he put miracle on it. He called it miracle. I won't say the whole name. He called it miracle. Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> But he had all these people coming in on appointments, and they pay on average fifty to seventy-five dollars per person. And then you know how it works, right? Your copayment if you have insurance. Uh, Florida is a different kind of state, so more than not, they pay cash for their appointments. So he he said, as part of the investment program, he says I give them a bottle of these multivitamins, and I say, take one of these every single day, and your, all your problems will be fixed. And when you're done with this bottle, come right back. He doesn't charge for it, he just gives it to him. And he says, you know what, 99% of the people come back with positive results and all it is is a Flintstone vitamin. He said, I don't charge them for it because they believe I'm the greatest doctor in the world, they keep coming back and they get what they need and I get what I need and I drive what I want. All it is is multivitamins. He said, you just put a different label on him. He had a manufacturer put his own thing. And he says, they tell their friends, their friends want to buy the vitamins. He said, they don't even know it's vitamins. They think it's some miracle cure in a bottle. He said, you know what? Placebo effect. Right? Placebos are funny, right? Because in a double-blind study, they give people a placebo and they give them a real medicine and they see what happens. And you know that a lot of people on par, pretty much even, even, <laughs> even, even, once taking a placebo, which is a fake, 
they believe they're being healed. So what's being fixed? Your mind. So this doctor has mastered the art of fixing people in their mind because this is going to fix me today. <laughs> Hallelujah. I'm fixed. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Amen. So is that a bad thing? No, because if you told one of these patients that feel like these multivitamins got them healed, you, and you tell them, no, that's a fake, that's a phony, you know what they would tell you? No, oh, you're crazy. It worked for me. And that's all that matters, right? So dominate your own earth, you fix all your problems, right? All right, so verse 27, you guys saw, right? Hallelujah. So God created man in his own image. So many you know that every one of us is created in the image of God. Don't say likeness. I've taught you this before. Verse 26 again. Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Everybody believes they have the likeness of God. They are like God. No. God left you the likeness part to you because you keep reading in 27. Right? So God created man in his own image. Stop. Where's the likeness? It's not there. And I, I, I don't believe that God did anything other than say, you know what? They have our image. They can handle it now. The likeness is where the enemy, Satan, came in and he, he saw an open door. He saw a crack because every one of us in this room has a different kind of likeness. Right? How many of you like poke? I hate poke. You see, I have my own likeness. How, how many of you like uh, a medium well steak. Hmm? Yeah, so do I. So you see there's something. How many of you like it rare? Yeah. How many of you say that's insane, man, right? Yeah. She likes it papa. She likes it black. Yeah. So she can scrape the ashes off, then eat. See, so everybody has a different kind of likeness. Let me ask you this. How many of you like peanut butter? Crunchy or creamy? See, everyone, blah, 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 blah. And what's your favorite jelly to put on it? See, all the different likenesses come out. Strawberry, guava, grape. Wow, what else? Oh. Some people say, you know, I, I know some people that only like honey with their peanut butter. Bananas. Oh, you see, all the different likenesses. See, if God said, let us make man in our image... And according to our likeness, and then it says he created man in his image and his likeness. You know what? You probably wouldn't tolerate BS too much. If you're created in God's likeness, you would not tolerate BS too much. And you know what? God wants you to be that way. He doesn't want you to tolerate that. He wants you to understand to dominate that. Don't let that dominate you. But you know what? Most of the people come around in your life and they bring their BS with them. And you tolerate it. So what is this message all about, boys and girls? Take on the likeness of God. If you're going to link a word to likeness, it might be dominion. Take dominion over other people's likenesses. Because they're going to bring their likeness to the table. And then you're going to wonder, hmm. You know when two people meet, you, you start, first thing is the external. Ooh. Oh. Oh, they're interested? Oh. You better look for the likeness. You know that there's homes filled with people who don't have the same likeness? Yeah. Hallelujah. So look at your notes here. God has given you the right to command everything in the earth. Is that a true statement? Well, in the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them. No likeness. Likeness is left to you now. What are you doing with the likeness that God has given you? Well, you still got to go back to the image of God. What is, what is God's image in your life? Well, you look in the mirror. Don't say, oh, God, you look... <laughs> Some of us every morning looking at me, oh God. Hmm? <laughs> so then we start the process of changing God's image. 
Mm -hmm. Look at Psalm 8, verse 6. Let's take a look at this now. All right. Hallelujah. All right. All right, yeah. You have made him, and that's us, by the way, to have. Read that carefully so that you get this deep in your likeness. You have made him, or just say, God, you have made me to have dominion over the works of. What did God create? Everything. All right. If you have a leaky roof, what do you do with it? Fix it. You have a problem in your life, what do you do? Fix it. If you're the problem in your life. Fix it. Don't ask God to help fix you. That's what the majority of people do when they pray, Lord, help me. Help me, Lord. Help you? I give you everything pertaining to life and godliness. If you got a problem, it's you. Yeah, fix you. How do you fix you? Come to church more often. Learn what you learn. Now, if you were part of a church system, they were teaching you and got you to a level and you could go no more. It's time to move on and migrate to something deeper. Uh, I'll be perfectly honest. You're in one of the final stages of Christianity right here. You know, if there's anything more to learn, I'll find it for you. Because <laughs> I get bored real fast. So whenever I go through notes, I get bored real fast. So I'll go look for new things within the Word. I'll find it. Then it's infinite. The Word is infinite. So we'll find it. Amen. Uh, you know that some people come here and they're like, wow, <gasps> wow. And then that's it. They go right back to where they were. <laughs> wow. Wow. Okay. I get a lot of calls from pastors where people come to visit from other churches and, you know, we say something in the service. They go back and use that as revelatory material to their pastor. And the pastor, I would appreciate if blah, 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 blah. I'm like, yeah, I never force them to come in. If they got something, you better explore that. Maybe God's trying to reach you through their likeness. Take a look again. You have made... Us or me, everybody say, make it personal. Make the word personal. Say, God, you've made me to have dominion over the works of your hands. So everything that God created is within your power to handle. And then the next line, what does it say? It put all things under my feet. Make it personal. Everything's under my feet. Why? Because you see it where? You guys all know. You see it in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Every sermon we have this scripture pop up, and it's here today on the next line here. But first, read that one. God has given you authority over the works of his hands. So what can you change? Well, look at the telescope. God made the mountain. What did it Some people feel very strongly about this telescope. He's so angry. That they would go stand in the rain and hold a sign yesterday. All over Hilo, people in the rain holding a sign. You feel that strongly about not expanding your knowledge base. You know that there's a lot of people protesting this message we're preaching this morning. Oh, come on now. If I even talk about casting out devils, how many Christians would rise up? Let me hold my sign. Everybody wants to hold a sign. And in the middle of all of that, there's a guy standing there and saying, Jesus is alive. Uh. <laughs> right here. In our own town. In the middle of all the protesters, one guy standing there, parking his car with a banner, says, Jesus is alive. Yeah. Okay, praise the Lord. He's been there all week. Yeah. Hallelujah. Uh, I'm going to tell you this. All right? Some people are asking me, what do you feel about the telescope? If I could afford a telescope, I'd be very interested in it. Because, let me just say this to all the Hawaiian people. You wouldn't be Hawaiian if it wasn't for the stars. You'd still be Tahitian. Hello? There would be no Hawaiians without the stars. You would be Tahitian. Come on now. What is the hokulea running off of right now, sailing around the world? The stars. <laughs> Hallelujah. 
there would be no Hawaiians if it wasn't for the stars. Right. They would all stay in Tahiti and go, I don't know how far read that thing. Stay home. <laughs> I'm just being honest. I'm not taking a side, I'm not taking a stance because I, I believe that when I look at that mountain, I see too many telescopes anyway. Yes, sir. Right? And I read this other guy, he's a Hawaiian and he's one of the astronomers up there. He's Hawaiian and he said that, well, where they're going to build it, you wouldn't see it because it'd be on the flatlands behind, on the north side of Mauna Kea. And you wouldn't see it because on that side, there's less dust or particles. And he said, these ones up on the ridge line, they're already having problems. Because of the wind flow going up and it partially obscures some things. So when they're looking at it, it looks, the dust in the air look like stars. That's my interpretation. <laughs> Got to clean the glass maybe. Eh? Got to clean, getting extra stars up there. Well, the thing for me is whenever somebody gets revelation, they run with that. So if you take an uneducated person and you take them up to a telescope and say, take a look at this, then they may have a whole different viewpoint of it. But when you close off something, you say, it's us and no more. And then, hey, I'll show you the picture of what I saw. Well, then you're going to get problems with the people. Yeah, man, the people are going to rebel against it. But if you say, hey, open tours, everybody can come up and look at the stars. Come up with, you know, bring all the protesters. Wait, before you protest... Why don't you come and see what we see and what we're studying and take a look and when they get up there and they go, wow. Which is what a lot of people come into our galaxy and then we teach them something and they go, wow. Then they're more open to the message. So that's my little rant for the whole telescope deal. Uh, I know one thing, I get cold real easy. So going up to the top of the mountain to look through a telescope, eh, it's easy to yell and scream down here in the warm climate, but go on the top of the mountain with your sign and go yell. I'm not talking about on the bottom of the road. I'm talking about the top of the top where they're going to build them. Stand over there and yell all you like. Within five minutes, you're going to want to say, this protest is over. Let me roll up my sign. Well, I see that a lot of you feel the same way as well. <laughs> it's easy for make plenty of noise where everybody stay. Go on the site where they're going to build and camp out. All I know is we, they used to take us camping volcano and that's not even on the top of Mauna Loa. And we used to freeze all night. And be like, this camping trip is over. <laughs> That's just volcano. Can you imagine the top of Mauna Kea? Oh my God. I like to see the guy with all his leaves closed. Remember that one guy was on it with all the leaves and his sign and his spear. I can tell you this right now. Okay, I was, when we were kids and taking Hawaiiana class in fourth grade, this Hawaiian man came and he told us this. Matter of factually, he told me this at Kapiulani school. He said, the Hawaiians would only go up in the middle of the day to look for tool implements on Mauna Kea because there's no food up there. There's nothing to farm up there. There's nothing to catch up there. They would only go dig around and look for tools to go and build down by the shoreline or on the farmlands. That was left alone because there's nothing up there. Hallelujah. So we fighting over something the ancient Hawaiians wouldn't fight over. No Promise, they wouldn't. Because this Hawaiian man told me straight up. He said, the Hawaiians wouldn't go up there. Like, eh. Too cold. Even Hawaiians get common sense. <laughs> Too cold. How are you going up there with your malo? <laughs> <laughs> And that's a long walk. It's a long drive through Saddle You want to walk all the way? <laughs> yeah, good luck with that. Yeah. You see, the ancient Hawaiians wasn't stupid. Yeah. 
Soon as they start getting into Kaumana already, oh, kind of cold, we should go back down. Because there's no bears and lions to take the skin and the pelt and use it to keep warm like Eskimos. Uh, well, sheep were introduced. Remember, sheep and cattle and all that were introduced later on. Oh, wild pig. You, you don't wear one wild pig coat? Come on. No. Mm, because pig hair is not soft. That's why they have Razorback. It's just, I'm just throwing thoughts out there. I'm not taking a slide. If it gets built, it gets built. If it doesn't get built, it doesn't get built. It doesn't matter because I wasn't going to sleep up there anyway. <laughs> Hallelujah. I remember my uncle guys came to visit one time when they, one of the telescopes was open. This was like 20 something years ago. My uncle said, hey, we should go. And I remember my grandma was like, it's cold up there. You guys are crazy. And I was like, eh, well, my uncle let go. So him and the wife, they came from Sacramento. Started going up there. We got to the visitor center. We got out of the car to look at what they had. And my uncle was like, okay, let's go. We're done. <laughs> we wasn't there three minutes. And I wholeheartedly agreed. Let's get out of here. It's warm in the car. And the guy said, well, the temperature change from the visitor center up there is like a 20 degree swing. He said, so if you're cold here, when you get up there, hallelujah. Mm -hmm. You see, we just got to be smart about things. If we're going to dominate things, yeah, we just got to be smart about it. it. A telescope is trying to dominate more knowledge base, right? It's trying to expand and increase the knowledge base. You cannot ever say that that's a stupid thing. Amen. Again, there would be no Hawaiians without the stars. They would be Tahitian. You would be Maori, you would be whatever you are. Right? Because, hallelujah, everybody came from some place to here. Look at all us, all chop suey. There was a lot of stars involved with our ancestors coming here. Some of you were created under the stars. <laughs> More kids born in November because of Valentine's. Anyway, all right, moving right along. Unless you came early. All right. You see, even for me, I was born in Baltimore, Maryland. Why? Because I came out early. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> so, do you have authority? Yeah. Well, implied authority. Everything's under your feet. What are you doing with it? Taking pills. Probably. Anyway. Ephesians 2, let's take a look at this one now, Ephesians 2, verse 6. All right, we'll get through this, hallelujah. I'm trying to streamline my messages more nowadays, cause, yeah, just because you guys get it. All right, but God, verse 4, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were, past tense, dead, in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you've been saved. Now I want you to understand it. We were dead in trespasses. God raised us up anyway. Amen. That's right. He forgave us anyway. Yeah. Even when we were dead in trespasses, yes. raised us up anyway. You guys see that? You got to have grace for people who don't know God. Amen. Because they were raised up too. Some people say, oh, put things. Because I go to funerals sometimes and they say, like, oh, and all the Christians congregate in the corner. Oh, I hope he received Christ or he went to you know where. Hey, bro, shut up. Shut up. So stupid. Why, why did you go to a funeral and judge a person that's dead? So stupid. You don't know what happens in the last moment. I know this. Everybody cries and screams out for Jesus, even if you're in a coma. Why? Because you know. The requirement is call on the name of the Lord and you will be, you, know, you shall be saved. So if somebody's dying, oh, oh, they get seconds of Jesus, 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 Jesus. Let me fill this up. Jesus, 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 Jesus. Yeah. Stay with the Lord. How fast was that? No. Who are you to say anything? 
I'm sure when you're in a coma, seeing the other side, oh, Jesus, say, you didn't take a person. You know what Christians are really hung up on? Personal credits. Personal credits. Well, I invited them to the Lord, and they didn't take it, so in my mind, they're burning in hell. That's, come on, come on, be honest. It's silly to us in here with a mature stance and viewpoint. But to other people, they believe that if you didn't respond to my invitation to Christ, you're going to burn in hell. Because it was told to me when I was a young man. Turn or burn was the words they used. That's the exact words that was told to me. But a turn or you burn. Like, uh, I'm going to burn. <laughs> You know, as you get mature in Christ, even the burning goes away. Yeah. Yeah. Deeper you go with God, you don't need nothing, right? You don't need. Addictions are a funny thing because there's a lot of eyes in the word addiction. Mm. All right. You guys see, and raised us up together and made us sit together where? So I got news for you. Even though your feet are here or your body's on earth, you're still seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Amen. Here you are. Here you are. But I'm on earth. Yeah, that's your mindset. You're on earth. Yes, we all are. Hello, until we go under the earth. But your spirit goes someplace else. Do you know that your spirit never goes under the earth ever again? Spirit is, as soon as you step out of this human body, you're in heaven already. Some people believe that the golden chariot is going to come for them. Well, on earth as it is in heaven, that may have been true in the Old Testament, but I believe in the New Testament right now, heaven is here on earth. When your spirit steps out of your body, you're in heaven. Because you're in a different plane of existence. That's it. You're not going to silver wings. Oh my God, are you waiting for the plane to come? Huh? That's what people believe, that they're going to the boarding gate and wait in line with everybody else. <laughs> Heavenly Airlines would like to announce a slight delay in your departure this morning. Uh, even over here, your flight has been canceled. What? Ah! <laughs> for all of you right now, I got news for you. Your flight has been canceled to heaven. Here you are. You're trying to bring this heaven out into your earth. Hello? Yep. I said it. All right. All right. And he raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So here you are. You're in a heavenly place in Christ Jesus, whether you know it or not. So it's either your earth is dominating your heaven or your heaven is dominating your earth. Just talk to somebody. You can figure that out within seconds what's dominating. Yeah. Amen. Because as soon as you get into a conversation with somebody, even if they know the Lord, they start talking about themselves. Ah, earth dominating you, eh? Because earth will come out quick. Well, you know, for me, I'm busy. I got to do this. I got to do that. I got to go here. I got to go there. I got to, my kids, my wife, my mom, my mom. Oh, so earth is dominating you. That's what it sounds like, right? Charlie Brown Christmas. Don't keep saying my last name over and over. Because I hear that all day long from people. Well, I ain't got it. It's because of this. And Pastor, you don't understand. <laughs> like, Lord, why did you give me this last name? They keep saying it to me. Why did you even give me Johnson as our last name? <laughs> Hallelujah. But people are people, amen. So when I got to deal with people, it's just, uh. so what do you think about that? You ready to get out of it? <laughs> Hallelujah. All right, read your line here. You have the authority to 
command the hand of God because you're seated in him. You're not just seated in heavenly places. You're seated in him. In him. Everybody say in him. So how about you show heaven before your earth? Do you know that if you're showing your earth before you show the heavenly, then um, you are in control of everything that's going on in your life. If you don't like it, then don't cry to God. Because if you're seated in him, they'll see him first. Even the demonic spirits will see God first, not you. And usually, if there's a demonic spirit involved, if you realize you're seated position in Christ, they'll see that and just leave you alone. They don't want to deal with it. Do you know that demonic spirits have a lifespan too? They have a one and done theory in the demonic realm where if I get cast out of a person and into the pit of hell, I can't come back. So they understand this. Christians don't understand this. That's why Jesus said in Mark 16, you cast out devils. Why? Because you cast them out, they got to go someplace. You're not going to just cast them out and they're going to live to fight another day. No, you get rid of them, they're gone. They go to the pit of hell and they don't come back. So these demonic spirits, they understand that. They understand that if one of these monkeys cast me out and throw me in the pit of hell, I, I'm done. That's it. My existence is over. But you know what? Christians are like, ooh, 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 spooky, ooh. So they'd rather avoid it and not deal with it. Hallelujah. So you know that the demonic realm is shrinking, right? It's getting less and less. So they're going to make more noise to try and make people more scared because of the defeating factor of the cross and all of us seated in heavenly places. This is what they try and do, get you to try and realize you're not seated in heavenly places. Based on your own information. They don't want you to get revelation. They want you to get information. Everything is based on information versus revelation. Because if something isn't revealed to you, you will rely on old information. What my pastor said, my friend, my father, my grandma. See, don't tell me your information. Tell me your revelation. All right, read this. To command is to... A point, a sign, or commission. So what are you doing with that? All right? Can you appoint something to do something for you? Of course you can. Can you assign something? Yeah. Can you commission something? Yeah. So go understand those three words and you'll understand your dominion. All right? Isaiah 45, 11. Take a look at this real quick. All right? Read that. Thus says the Lord. This is Old Testament now. I want you to know that it's an accomplished thing once the finished work of Christ is taking place. The Holy One of Israel and His Maker. Ask me of things to come concerning my sons and concerning the work of my hands. Say that. Who is He referring to? Us. So what is God telling us even from the Old Testament? Command my hands. Tell me what you want. Tell me what you want me to do. More often than not, people are, well, I don't believe I'm worthy. I don't think I'm capable. I don't think I've been ordained. I don't think I qualify. Uh, you guys see this? I'm seeing something. The Lord says, and this is the Lord, the Holy One of Israel, and my maker asked me of things to come concerning my sons. That's people. All right. And considering the work of my hands, you, you command me. You tell me what you want. Tell me what you need. And more so because it's a finished work now, you don't even have to ask God anymore. You just do it. You live the life that you believe you should live. Whether you like it or not. You know, I, got, I got grace preachers always saying, well, you know, we're forgiven, but, no, it's not a but. What are you trying to say? If I do that, I'm going to hell? No, not quite saying that. But they have nothing to stand on. They just got to make stuff up. You know, it irritates me. People who don't have an answer and try and make up one. Man. It's like a little kid. You see them steal the cookie from the cookie jar. Why do you say? Well, on the spot, they'll make up a story. Kids are funny. I just saw a kid, I don't know, last week, running around, fall out. See, I told you you're going to fall. Uh, but I never fall. I wasn't running. 
Even though you see them, they make up a story. Yeah. Yeah. I told you no run, and you didn't run, and you didn't fall. Now look. I wasn't running. Well, then, the answer is, you're clumsy, like the person telling you was probably clumsier. No. I don't know. God, look at your notes, will not get involved in your life unless you permit him. And that still goes today, even in the finished work. You still got to let God do what he wants to do with you. Okay, some of us are like, well, I thought God would take care of this. No, that's why he sent you. You don't understand that you're a sent one from heaven. God sent all of us to go do his work. God sent us. And we're asking God why you sent us. And then more so, help me. I need help. You don't understand. Oh, my God. All right, read the next line here. When you choose not to use your authority to assign the hand of God, you have decided to? Ain't that the truth? Mm hmm. Yeah. Lord, heal me. Oh, never work. I got to go, doctor. Maybe you're going to give me vitamins. And fix my head. Miracle. Miracle Flintstone vitamin. Just go down to your local store and go pick up a bottle of vitamins, peel off that label, make one on your computer, put them on and call it Miracle. Say, oh my God, look what I found. You got to take these and fix your whole life. Three bucks, you fix somebody's problems probably. Right? Just put your own sticker over it and say, hallelujah. This thing I got straight from God. Unbelievable. Make sure you don't tell them take 50 and <laughs> multivitamin. And you know what this doctor is telling me in Miami is most people get healed anyway because they have a, a mineral deficiency anyway. So it does have some effect. Not totally, oh, I gave them pills I made in my lab. Made out of toilet paper and sugar. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, well. Just go with it. Uh, how many eat tomoe ame? You know the, the candy tomoe? Yeah, yeah. I saw a holy girl trying to peel the pepper off. And they said, no, you just eat the whole thing. When I was in Florida, I was going to school way back in the day. I, my mom and my dad, the one thing I was craving from Hawaii was white rabbit. You guys know white rabbit? Yeah, white rabbit. Mm. And I used to open them, and I used to give them to all my classmates. They would open them and be like, there's another paper in there you can't get off. I said, you eat that one. No, you can't eat paper. And I show them. And they're like, oh, my God, that's a miracle. So my mom used to be like, how come you like me send you these candies? Oh, my God. It's like, because I baffle these howlies. Throw them off. She's like, what? And then she's like, it's expensive, you know, to mail this. And one day I was, just, lo and behold, I found a Chinese grocery store in Florida, Bradenton, Florida. I walked in and they had a whole shelf full of white rabbit. I was thinking, hmm. And you know, I got these, these howly kids hooked on white rabbits. So I used to put them in little bags, and he used to tell them, you guys want? Came all the way from Hawaii. I'll give you five bucks for it. Shoot, I was making five bucks off of white rabbits. Because you could eat the pepper. <laughs> Threw them off. Well, you know that when you get a revelation of something, you want to explore that more and more and more. Yeah. So these guys are like, oh my God. Then they were, I took it to my family and I showed them, you got any more of those white rabbits? Oh, the shipping is bad, but I think I can get some. Man, I give you 10 bucks for it, right? Yeah. Oh, okay, let me go try and find. The next day I would have you, man, how'd you get that shipped all the way from Hawaii overnight, man? It's a miracle. Timmy Wall Express, bruh. Anyway, 
Hey, I was broke, man. Going to school ain't easy. I was broke. So any little bit of money help. Amen. Praise God. Especially when, you, when you're wearing a paramedic uniform and you get 50% off at all the restaurants. And you got to struggle along and eat all of that, bro. Tough going. All right. So don't decide to handle these challenges on your own. Now take a look at ver- uh, James 4. All right. Some of you know this because you spend more time in the New Testament. Amen. All righty. Where do wars and fights come from among you? Do they not come from your desires for pleasure that war in your members? Ah. Oh, hallelujah. Take a look. Why do most people not come to church? Because they think I'll be miserable that day. Anyway. You lust and you do not have. You murder and covet and cannot obtain. You fight and war, yet you don't have because... <laughs> you ask and don't receive because you ask. I miss that you may spend it on your pleasure. So I got news for you. If you say, Lord, give me a million dollars, you you guys know what to do with it. Well, go give me my 10%. No, that's probably why you're not getting it because you, you're counting. Remember when we first started off this service? You're keeping track. You're counting. Amen. I only get two Percocets in the bottle. I got to go back. Doctor. <laughs> Heal. In Jesus' name. You know that most people that are addicted to pills is because they can't get off the addiction of the pills. That's why they I'm not an addict. Shut up. If you keep going back for prescriptions, guess what? You're an addict. Stop lying. Hallelujah. Last time I saw my dad, he had a stack of prescriptions. I was like, OxyContin, Flexeril, what? Soma? I said, do you take all this? Nah. I don't need. Why I need that for? I would never wake up. I said, I'll take some of those. Oh, yeah. I know some people I want to put to sleep for a while. I'll give you, I'll give you five-hour energy at the start of service. Everybody be awake. Like, hallelujah, praise God. Hallelujah. How many? Uh, and by the way, how many of you like coffee? I don't like coffee. I drink five-hour energy. Yeah. But we offer you free coffee because I'm thinking of you first. <laughs> Five hour energy costs money. It's like little Starbucks. Three bucks each. So that's what I drink. I drink that. Some people, oh, that thing is nasty. When I drink coffee, oh, that thing is nasty. Oh, yeah. But you like that, right? Some of you like that. Mm. I'll tell you, I'm going to re bottle Five Hour Energy and we'll call it Miracle. Gonna wake you up, bro. Five dollars. Half of your day will be awesome. You gotta come back for the other half. All right. So if you ask a miss, then whose fault is it? Mm-hmm. Everybody in here, you're a CEO. You're a chief executive officer of your own life. How do you run your company? Huh? Is your company dilapidated and falling apart? It's because of you. If you had a company that was beautiful and awesome and a brand new building, and you hire a custodian, and he mops, and as you're walking down your shiny floors, you see he missed the spot. What do you do? There's two things you can do, right? You can call a custodian and say, you missed the spot and have him think that you're a micromanager and an idiot. You hired me to clean it. I cleaned it. But I missed the spot. Or you can say, these stupid custodians, they don't know what the hell they're doing. Let me with a mop stay. Get the mop, fill up the bucket, go over there and scrub the spot. And then come back and uh, everybody tell you, you missed the spot. You see, it never ends if you're going to go at it that way. But you're a chief executive officer of yourself. How do you govern yourself? Are you living the greatest life possible? Or are you still waiting for things to happen? You know that a lot of people come into Christianity like this. They aspire to be a leader. Okay? That's not a bad thing. But when they get to the leadership spot, they forget that you are not a leader of people. You're a leader of self and people follow your example. 
Don't come in and tell me how to do it when you can't do it yourself. You're not a boss. You are a leader. Jesus said, come, follow me. He didn't say, come, serve me, bow down to me, scrub my toenails. He didn't say any of that. They did it because they wanted to and saw the example of Jesus. Don't come in thinking you're a boss. This is not a business like the world. Because the majority, you know that church doesn't have to have a building. So in its entirety, a church is just people. You are a church. You're a pastor, whether you like it or not, of yourself. If you can't lead yourself, who's going to follow you? You see, you cannot come in and ask your people to bow down to you. You got to do the opposite. It's an opposite effect because the only reason they came was because you helped them in the first place. You see, it's all backward. People come in with a business mindset. I've had tons of people come to this church for a while and tell me, you know what you should do. And you know, they don't last because they come in thinking that people got to bow down to them when... It's the opposite. Yeah. I've lost a lot of people because other people keep me busy. And one person feels slighted, they leave. So you know that church in and of itself is just people and their personalities. We lost a high profile couple in our church last year. Why? Because other people took up all the time and I couldn't adequately take it. And they felt slighted. They got upset. But you know what? In the midst of this one person, this one couple leaving, a girl got healed of terminal cancer. Yes, but you see, they don't look at that. Well, he must have been ministering to somebody else who needed it. You know, when I teach you to a certain level, you can handle yourself. You are a CEO of yourself. You don't need attention. You don't need me there all the time. So other people get ministered to. You know this one couple that left our church? Yeah, they left and they got really pissed off. But here's the thing. A little girl, seven years old, got healed of terminal cancer. The same week. The same exact week. But if I tell them that, they're like, oh, well, but you never come see me. You're in your 80s. Who has more upside? You already got the kingdom grace message. You can handle this. A seven-year-old cannot handle this. You know, they, people are stupid at their best. Well, we're leaving. So what do you want me to do? Rope you, tie you down, and drag you back in? Don't know. And the thing that they say is that, well, we're leaving, but you're still our spiritual father. The church is not a dysfunctional family, boys and girls. This is a real living, breathing entity. If I'm not paying attention to you to the level you need, just realize this. Somebody else is getting it. Who needs it more than you. You see, I don't waste my time with people who supposedly are already fixed. Yeah, you may be going through a little crisis or dilemma, but you get through it because of the word you already got. These people don't know that yet. So I got to focus here. Oh, but, but, but. You shut your, oh, shut up. Shut up. Knock it off. You know, attention is not what you need. Because you got all of the attention. You, do you know that the Bible says there's a great cloud of witnesses watching you at every moment? Let's put it this way. You got way more attention than you deserve. You better be doing the right thing for the attention you're getting already. You know, I got news for you. 80-year-old people, you're going to die soon. That's just a known fact. But a 7-year-old has a lot of upside. If I touch a life at 7, they will serve until another 70-something years. They will serve and reach people for the Lord because of one experience. How many more experiences are you going to have in your 80s? Unless you're out there actively doing the gospel. Yeah, I, I met this guy one time. He was a disciple and an associate of Smith Wigglesworth. He was in his 80s. He came up to me and he says, I'm dying, Tim. I said, oh, you want me to pray for you? He said, no. No. I'm good. You need to pray and reach the younger ones. He said, I'll be fine. If God takes me now, I'm ready. I don't need the attention of man. And I said, well, I'll pray for you anyway. He said, I appreciate that. He said, sure. He was from London. 
prayed for him. Within a year, he was dead. And you know what? He left me a letter before he died. He said, keep fighting the good fight. Because I didn't ask you to pray for me, but you did anyway. He said, I know you're for real. Mm. Even though he said, no, you don't need to. I said, no, let me pray for you. He put his hand on me. And he says, may the mantle of this ministry be upon you. Right after that, I started to see miracles start happening like crazy. And you know what the miracle is? The more people got miracles, the more people got mad at me. So this is a fine line. How many know that Jesus did miracles and the other half killed him? You know, people are crazy. This is crazy. You know, it's a set mind, a mindset. You get crazy. Yeah, I get busy, but I always have time to say hello or whatever. But, you know, there's sometimes before church and after church, it's tough for me because I'm still processing. I'm still, you know, my mind is like this the whole time before church and right after. Do you tell me stuff? I'm probably not going to remember. But tell me anyway, no problem. But if I forget, please refresh my memory because at the time, people don't understand what it is when the anointing starts flowing through you. Before church, on my way here, it's already starting. I can feel the building. This is what my head sounds like all the time. <laughs> Serious. I'm not even joking. And afterward, it's like... So I got to go and be by myself. Usually just kick back for a few hours after and just let it kind of flow through. And then I'm good. Because I'm no good to anybody when the thing is like that. But you know, that's the time. Everybody, oh, pastor never say hi to me. Pastor never talked to me. Pastor wasn't looking at me. Good night. Bro. Can you like calm down? Calm down. I have a bottle of miracle for you someplace. The only danger with the multivitamin, I told a doctor this, is if, if a guy goes through 10 things in one day, he's going to take 10 pills. He said, that might not be a bad thing. <laughs> he was joking, of course. He was laughing. He said, no, no, no. I thought I'd take no more than two a day. I said, yeah, but yeah, aren't those one a days? He said, nah. He said, they'll just, they'll just discharge it. It's no problem. Yeah. Praise God. for. All right, your last line on your notes, God is a gentleman. He'll never violate your will. So whatever you want supersedes whatever God wants. Whether you like it or not. You want to be hard-headed your whole life? Guess what? You supersede God. You can be hard-headed your whole life. That's just the way it works. I'll tell you this, and you can all gasp or whatever. But when I was a young kid, my grandpa said this. A hard head makes for a soft ass. That's true. Yeah. I'll just, you can gasp. <gasps> but it's a yeah, hard head. You get licking in the old days. You no. Know? Here's the thing, you get hot head now, you're not going to get licking hourly, you're going to get licking spiritually. And not because God is licking you, it's because you're licking yourself, because you're not living up to the true identity of Christ. You're getting lickings all by yourself. All right, so be smart. Hallelujah. You all good? All right, everybody, look at the teddy bear. Oh, Even a teddy bear can dominate all his cookies in life. I right, know, no more band-aids, this teddy bear. If you don't know what we're talking about, the last service we had, we had a teddy bear with band-aids on. Opposing position. You remember that? All right, let's all stand. Hallelujah.